So I'm very pleased to be part of this business community with Dabs today and uh, to share with you the topic on executive loneliness. So how did I come up with this topic, executive loneliness? Well, through EGN, I'm working with a lot of senior executives and rightly as Vanilla said, we're looking at the challenges that they're facing and we are trying to create a safe space where people are signing a non-disclosure agreement so that you open up and you share what is really going on. And the more honest the conversation got, the deeper we got, I realized that things are not really so well. There's a lot of people suffering. There's a lot of people that are holding these topics secret on the heart. So we decided to do an anonymous survey to just investigate how really is the state of the mental health, how are people feeling and so on. And we sent this out and uh, the result was quite shocking. I will share with you today the result from that survey, some of the insights, some of the key findings. I will also share a few of the case studies of people that I've spoken with. Because at the end of the survey, people could tick a box if they wanted to discuss further. And you'd be amazed how many people actually had wanted to speak further. How many who were pleased just to be asked to speak up because this is something that they have kept inside them. And we just started then um, one year ago, this project basically, and it's uh, received a lot of media exposure in Singapore and globally. Here is actually the biggest media exposure ever in Singapore, uh, which was four full pages in the Business Times in February this year. And just uh, last month here, another full page in the Straight Times. and. Yes, it's leading with my picture, but it's not so much about me. I just put myself there to say, well, I share my story, what happened in my career and the challenges I've had, and I invited then others. Because if you open up first and you say uh, your story, then others are also feeling quite comfortable to share theirs. So that is what we're going to talk about today. But before we jump into looking at the findings, the research, let me just share with you my story. Because I'm glad to be with you here today. In 2018, I had crashed myself. Um, and uh, I just, today looking back, I'm just glad to be alive. Um, sadly, during this time, there was a friend and colleague of mine who didn't make it through, who committed suicide. I will share with you today the differences, why I'm here still alive today, and try to look at what happened in his case and why didn't he managed to reach out. Why didn't he call for help and go to the extreme length of committing suicide? So with my project, that's my ultimate goal to really raise awareness around the stigma, around mental health and to prevent these sad cases from happening. Because if we keep things inside us, then you never know what can happen one day. But if we just speak up to someone, a colleague, a friend, a wife, a husband, then that person is most likely going to help you. So during these times, especially with COVID-19, people have been suffering more challenges than ever before. So indeed, this topic that I started to research already before COVID-19 is now more extreme than ever. So let me take you back to year 2008. I'm an expat living and working in Ho Chi Minh City, Saigon. I've worked for the company for about one year and I did quite okay. During these times, I had two different MDs. They promoted me, I worked up my way. I was the sales, national sales director for Vietnam for the company. And I was in line basically to become the managing director for one country in Asia. I then had a third MD coming in the role. And let's say that we had a bit of a clash. I wasn't probably mature enough to see support him. Rather, I started to perhaps resent him and having the team on my side and trying perhaps to talk around his back and I think he could feel it that I was not a very supportive staff. I wanted his job and he could smell it. So basically, uh, one day I was called into his office and I was let go. Just when I come home that evening and I told this news to my ex-wife, she said, Nick, the timing couldn't be worse, I'm pregnant. And at that time, I hadn't lived in Sweden for 10 years and I was scared of moving back home, already an expat comfortable living in Asia, but I didn't have much of a safety net. And it can be shocking when you lose a position, when you lose your job, you lose your income, when you're so far away from home, 
you have nothing to stand on. Many times your work permit is tied to the company, your house is provided by the company, everything. So basically you own your own and you're very much perhaps left on the street. And here I am to become a father and I was definitely not in a state and ready for that. And I also wanted to show that I can do this alone. I didn't want to tell my parents back home in Sweden what was going on. I didn't want to tell my family. I wanted to show that I'm fine. I will find a new job. But behind the scene, I was scared. I was alone. I didn't talk to anybody about what happened. So that was the first time when I really got uh, serious anxiety. I sleepless night about this. I, uh, luckily, after a few months, I got a new job and in, also in Ho Chi Minh City. And I did quite okay in the job. So well that I stayed there for a few years. And when my son was five years old, I got a promotion to move as MD for a bigger branch of theirs in Indonesia. I'm still here now in a French fashion company, moved to Indonesia. So relocated over with my ex-wife and my son. And um, when we arrived in Jakarta, my son got into school there and we moved into a house. And just three months after that, the company I worked for was sold and I was let go again. So here I was again now in a new city with a, com with a company. And um, again, I didn't really know what to do. I basically went home to my ex-wife and I said, I cannot cope with this. I cannot imagine now our son being out of school and so on again. I mean, what is happening here now to us? We're on the street again and I have to find a new job and it's too much pressure for me to just cope with this. And so I did basically in panic mode, I asked my ex-wife, please move back to Sweden with our son. At least then you can stay with your parents for a while. Our son can at least go to school and just leave me here. Just leave me here in Jakarta, I will find a job. Um, so that's what we did. And again, I tried to show that everything was fine on the outside and I tried to control my life. I got into a lot of exercise, trying to do the best I could. And again, I found another job. And this time the job was with International SOS as GM for Indonesia. So I got back to a company that I had worked with earlier in Vietnam. It was a great position, great job. And I came in and I did well, but I was so anxious behind me. Uh, I was so scared that I was going to lose the job again. So we kept looking, well, should my son and ex-wife come back to Indonesia? And I said, no, let's just wait. Let me pass the probation. Let's see if a year goes. You never know if I lose this job again, if something happens. So I, I was just so insecure inside me. And I was always worried what people were saying around my back, what was going to happen. I was terrified when I received an email from my boss because I thought maybe she's gonna send me an email that I should come to the office and I'm, I'm gonna be terminated again. So that was what's going on on my mind to the point where at the end of, of, of about one and a half year in the job, I wrote my own resignation and I just resigned one day because in my mind, I thought it's better I resign than I'm being fi fired from a job again. When she received that email, she did call me into the office and she was absolutely shocked. She said, Nick, you are doing so well, we have all these opportunities for you. He said, what's wrong? Is it Indonesia? We can move you to Dubai. Do you want to roll in the US? What do you want? We don't want to lose you. We want to keep you in this company. But in my mind, I was already out of that. I just couldn't take it. And that's when I walked out of there, didn't leave on great terms because I was just men mentally not ready for it. And that's basically when I crashed. And I went through very dark days by myself. Uh, didn't really know what was going on. And I started to turn to alcohol and uh, that was my relaxation. Instead of exercise, I lost all my good habits and things were not looking good for me. Um, luckily, I, I got a job with EGN at this time in 2016 and I helped them with setting up in Vietnam. And then in January 2018, they relocated me to Singapore but I was still not really recovered. I was working on it, but I was still very anxious and worried and uh, I couldn't sleep well at night. Um, so when I moved to Singapore, this is a picture of me. Uh, I had gained about 20, 25 kilos. I have a smile on the photo, but that's after work and it started to become 
a habit of me in order to relax after work. I worked hard. Well, I deserve to go for a drink. And that became uh, almost every day that this had to become my pattern. And I fell into these bad habits. And, and, and this circle just continued. And I couldn't get back into healthy habits. And worse it got. And then in April 2018, this is a photo of my foot. Um, really swollen. We did x-rays, everything, and because the doctors thought it must be broken. Well, it wasn't broken. It was only when I saw a psychologist and a therapist who said this is a psychosomatic disorder, an illness which is basically related to mental illness, just showing that I had so much stress inside my body and so much anxiety that this occurred on my foot. And it, it was so big, the swollen foot, that I couldn't even put on a shoe. And I remember here in March, April 2018, lying in my bed and wondering what's happening to me. I remember my heart rushing so I could hardly breathe. And I just had no hope. Uh, I was not suicidal in the sense that I wanted to take my own life, but I certainly thought that life was over. I, I just couldn't see how could I get back on the right path again. Uh, so that was how the days for me. And I was starting then to reach out, trying to see, um, to get some help and so on. At this time also, I wrote my will. I wrote my testament because I, I basically thought that this is over. So at least my ex-wife, my son, they should be able to get the, the little money I have in assets. At least it shouldn't go to waste. So I cleaned all of these things up. And just when I think I hit the lowest point of my life, my life suddenly just switched and it started to turn around. But then something happened. A colleague and friend of mine committed suicide. Now, Simon was working in Singapore in the HR space, in the recruitment agency space. And just out of the blue, he committed suicide. He was supposed to speak on the topic of future work at one of our EGN events, but he didn't show up even for the the briefing we were going to have a rehearsal and he didn't show up for that one and i was wondering what happened and then i got a message saying that simon had committed suicide came to shock to me to all of us we had no idea that he had something going on inside him he looked like a happy guy he had just come back from mount everest where he climbed up to the base camp which was one of his dreams he just fulfilled his dreams he had a girlfriend which he really loved he shared on Facebook that he'd never been happier and he looked so happy on all the photos. So on the outside, everything just looked like a dream. Uh, yet, he was too quickly gone. I was so puzzled with this that I started to reach out to his family in the UK. I set up calls with his brother uh, to try to figure out what happened here. And even his brother couldn't even understand it. They were quite close. Um, so I said, what should we do here? Well, let's try to make sure that this case doesn't happen again. And so instead of knocking myself down and sitting at home getting depressed over, I decided to take action. That's when I uh, contacted SOS, which is the Samaritans here in Singapore. It's a suicide prevention agency, a charity. Um, with, um, and I contacted them and I said, I want to help. So I set up the campaign, raised to an end, of executive loneliness. That brings me to how to then overcome um, executive loneliness. And before I throw this to the floor and hear from you uh, with your tips and in how you can overcome it, and I'm sure you all learned some fantastic tools, how to connect now during the COVID-19 times, how to get closer to each other. But let me just uh, share with you how I managed to turn around from lying in bed with a foot swollen like a balloon where I could hardly walk for 500 meters into completing uh, Ironman Sweden in August last year. So that's a 3.8 kilometer swim, 180 kilometer cycle ride, and then you run a marathon after. So how can I turn around my life like that in just one year? Well, I did it by speaking up. I did it by sort of opening up my mouth. I met a new wife. And I told her what was going on. That was the first person for many years that I, she started to be honest with. But it was because also I started to be honest with myself. I said, I, because I'm going to die if I don't do something. I was so scared that that was the point I was. I basically had given up. I had surrendered. And that's why I thought, well, 
I have nothing to lose. Are you going to die or I have to speak up? So I told my wife, and then we started to look at, and I started to write down on the papers everything that was wrong with me. And I started to see doctors. I started to see psychologists. I got a fitness coach, nutrition coach. So basically, I did massive, 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 big, big action. I, I bought the, the Garmin watches where you can track your sleep, uh, the weight. I bought the new scale. And I, so I basically set up all the support I needed to track it and to get well. And uh, it was amazing how quickly I managed to break it. It started by walking two kilometers per day for a week and then up to three kilometers. And within just a few months, I started to jog, cycle. I got a swim coach so I could swim. So I shifted also all my bad habits of going to the bar after work, turning into good habits. And then having someone accountable, so a fitness coach that looked after it. So the, the devices are so great these days that you can track everything and you can see that you are following the right path. Um, so that all of those things work really well. I, because also I had a, the drinking problem, I had to admit that. And uh, I went to AA, which is an organization for people that were drinking uh, problems. And uh, I found uh, great support in that organization. And that's a volunteer organization, basically. So it, you might think then when I'm saying the actions I took that it cost a lot of money. It doesn't actually, that's probably an excuse that people might have. It does, I didn't spend much money. I just needed to see a, a therapist two times about this and a few times here and there, and then get a coach to do a six month plan, which is monitored by devices. So, and I had the ultimate goal of doing this race. I signed up for the race one year and I had, so I had one year to train for it. And the feeling to just come back was unbelievable. And uh, just, Start, starting to talk to other people, finding myself. Today, when I'm surrounded by people, I feel a connection and uh, I feel very healthy and much great. And I just need to share my story because of that, because what happened to Simon that he had to go, he didn't have someone obviously that he just opened up to. He perhaps kept it inside him. And uh, it's sad anytime I read about suicide, the first thing I'm thinking now is, why didn't that person just speak to one or two people about this and their life would have been saved? Because that's all it is. But for us out there, we need to look out for these people and try to be vulnerable yourself. Because if you are vulnerable yourself with your family, friends, colleagues, and you open up, even with small steps when you're not well, tell them honestly what's happening. Then you will be surprised that they will maybe the next day come to you and share what's going on in their lives. So you're creating this positive new habit of being honest and vulnerable. So what happened then uh, now during COVID-19 with me? Um, well, I have to say I, I went through some challenging times like everyone else, um, especially my, here's a photo of my son in Sweden a few months ago. He's now 11 years old. He lives uh, with my ex-wife in Sweden and uh, he was booked to come to Singapore over Easter to visit me. Uh, of course, with the travel restrictions and so on, that never happened. And uh, I became very resentful. I started to become angry inside me. I was angry at the, the laws and regulations. Why can he not travel here? And I said, it, it should be okay. And in the end, it, it couldn't happen. And on top of that, we had a travel agency where we booked hotel flights and we booked the travel insurance for this. Everything went bankrupt. We also lost the money for the flight and everything else and the hotel, all expenses. So I was in a bad place and I, I couldn't get over this and I, I didn't really know what to do. Should I fly to Sweden? But then I cannot come back to Singapore for my job and my wife here and everything else. So this was going on in my, in my head and I started to read a lot of news, watching the news and of course following the COVID numbers. And I felt really, really bad into it back into some bad patterns. Luckily, I didn't go back to drinking alcohol or, or, or going that deep. I managed instead to really take a breath and think, okay, Nick, take a pause here now. What's going on? So what I did, even though I wasn't drinking, I came back to the, the AA groups and, and just shared my challenges. I started to open up. I said, this is what's happening. And they started to give me some advice. I then also uh, made an appointment with a family therapist. And this family therapist said, find out what your son loves to do. 
and it wasn't actually what I thought. He loves to play online games. So now actually I bought the online game. We play multiplayer games together. So on Saturdays for two hours, uh, I log on here in Minecraft from Singapore. Uh, I sent him a headset and a webcam. So we see each other in the game and he has built a house for me inside the game. He played during the weeks and he collect things. He put in a box for me and on the weekend when we play, he, he shows me what he's created during the week. So I'm coming into his digital world, which an 11 year old is perfectly fine with. It's only my mind, my traditional old mind that would be that we need to be in the same place. We need to go cycling, swimming and do these things. But that's not exactly what he wanted. But I needed someone else to help me to see that because I was too much in a negative spin. So that's uh, how I managed to turn it around. And I'm so pleased that I now have this mindset when things are not going well, seek help, speak up and move on. So that was my story. Thank you so much uh, for listening. I now want to really open up the floor to hear from you and uh, we can have a Q&A, but basically I, I put here also, either you can write if you want, you can speak up about how to overcome executive loneliness and what are your tips or any questions for me. Thank you.